I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from the front lines, discuss tensions over Ukraine's application to join the EU, and Francis Dernley interviews Marcy Kapta, a member of Congress for the Democrats since 1983 and a key player in US-Ukraine relations. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 29th of September, one year and 217 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our Associate Editor for Defence, Dominic Nichols, and Assistant Comment Editor, Francis Sternley. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from the front lines. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So the latest news, I'll come on to the jet in a moment, but the latest news is breaking in the last hour. A powerful explosion is reported from Russian-occupied Berdyansk, that's in Zaporizhia, Oblast, almost halfway between Melitopol and Mariupol, slightly closer to Mariupol, but it's on the on the um, the coast of the Sea of Azov. Ukrainian authorities are saying that's reported this afternoon, and as of the time of this broadcast, there's only been four hours of the afternoon in Ukraine, so it is uh, it's it's very very fresh. Um, this explosion, so this comes from the the news comes from the head of the city's military administration, Victoria Halitsina. Um, and this explosion is, is said to have been followed by power supply interruptions across the city. And that report, Hallett Senior is saying, it comes from Berdyansk residents. So no no more than that. Speculation that the only thing really that's been happening in that area of late is partisan activity. Whether or not this is, this, that's pure speculation. I haven't been able to verify the information otherwise. I just note that if, if residents are saying are saying that and there's no reports of Drones were seen, missiles were seen, aircraft, etc., etc. I just wonder what it was. But, you know, mark and, and move on. Something's happening down in Berdyansk. Separately, now, last night, Russian air defences in the area shot down or reported to have shot down one of its own jet fighters. So on Thursday night, this is a Russian Su-35, one of the one of the very modern aircraft, shot down over Tokmak. Tokmak is the town about 12-ish miles south of where the Ukrainian advance has reached at the moment. Tokmak's a big rail and road infrastructure, or sorry, rail and road junction, and therefore it's, it's a logistically important hub to get to. That that seems to be the route Ukraine is trying to force from Tokmak down then on to uh, Melitopol. But an SU-35 seems to be downed last night by Russian air defences, a Russian telegram channel with close links to the Air Force seemingly confirmed the incident this morning paying tribute to the pilot who it said did not survive there's footage on social media you'll, you'll see it fireball coming out of the sky and russian channels again not been able to verify this but russian channels are saying that that it was an s-300 missile very capable air defense missile that shot down that aircraft so two two things there that have happened in the last few hours that we've not been able to verify but coming in from a number of channels now, separately, this morning, Russia has said that it destroyed 11 Ukrainian drones overnight, although it says one of those had dropped explosives on a substation, what they're describing as a substation, and cutting local power supply. That was from a, a local regional governor. Russia's defence ministry then said that one drone had been shot down in the uh, Kaluga region. So this is inside Russia. Sorry if I didn't say that before. So inside Russia, uh, one drone shot down in, uh, in Kaliga region. That's to the southwest of Moscow and over 10 in the Kursk region. Kursk region is right down south. It borders Ukraine. The city of Kursk is right in the, in the middle of the region. And that's about the city itself is about 150 k's north of due north of Kharkiv. So Kursk governor Roman Staryovoit said that the region had been massively attacked by Ukrainian uh, drones. He reported that in uh, Belaya village, which is, a, well, less than 25 k's from the border, about 50 k's due east of Sumy in Ukraine, he said, quote, a Ukraine drone dropped two explosive devices on a substation. One of the transformers caught fire. Five settlements and a hospital were cut off from power supply. Fire crews rushed to the scene. Power will be restored since it's safe to do so. 
Now, separately, Ukrainian media are citing a source in Ukraine's security service, the SBU, that said that a drone in the Kursk region had destroyed a Russian radar system. So that that's probably the same incident. Ukraine citing the SBU saying, or Ukraine media citing the SBU saying it was a radar station, Russian governor saying it was a an electricity power station. So again, can't verify either of those, but something's happening there. Elsewhere yesterday, Russian shelling was across the country, killed three three people down in Hezon and other civilians in uh, eastern Donetsk region. That's from local officials. And obviously down in, down in Hezon, Russia has repeatedly shelled the city and the neighboring areas from their positions on the east bank. Uh, hoping to hear possibly next week from Colin Freeman, our, um, our guy who's out in Ukraine at the moment. I know he was that was on his list of things to do. Don't know if he's there at the moment, but it'd um, be good to catch up with him. Now, just a couple more. There are suggestions that we've been speaking about this recently up in the northeast. So as Ukraine has been concentrating down south, it seems Russia has been trying to push in the northeast front, if you like, towards towards Kharkiv. But there are some suggestions that that effort there might be running out of steam. So reporting from ISW, the Institute for the Study of War, said that Russian forces have reduced the tempo of their offensive operations up in the Kupiansk, Savatove, Kremina line. So this is about 50 k southeast of Kharkiv. Um, it's thought the efforts there were intended to try and draw Ukrainian forces away from the southwest, as, as we suggested. But it seems possible the opposite has happened. And actually, Russian units have had to be drawn away from trying to block those Ukrainian advances to, to shore up or, or for that effort in the northeast, which, which seems to have um, culminated. Now, Ukrainian spokesman Colonel Mikhailo uh, Shalyevich said yesterday Russian forces were conducting defensive operations and had reinforced units in the past week in the area, as opposed to offensive and reinforcing because they, they're breaking through. The Ukrainian General Staff's morning and evening situation reports, their sit reps, so they put out daily updates, one in the morning, one in the evening. So yesterday, take the two together, Yesterday's reports said that there had only been one Russian attack south of uh, Crimea near Bilarivka. That's right in the centre of the Donbass. And that Russian aviation, so uh, attack helicopters basically, had become increasingly active to make up for this, this sort of diminution in the ground attacks. There are suggestions that Russian airstrikes are increasingly going for the Ukrainian controlled bridges across the Oskil River. That's the river that runs kind of north south in this part in the northeast of Ukraine. It runs virtually north south in um, Kharkiv Oblast, about 80 Ks east of of the city itself. And that would obviously be or presumably be to try and stymie the threat of any Ukrainian offensive operations east of the river. So that suggests that if they were trying to push west they are now not, not able to con- continue that assault. Military term is culmination. I, you're not necessarily going backwards. You're still incredibly dangerous and violent, but you're not going forward. So it seems as if the, the steam has come out of the Russian mini offensive, whatever we want to call that, up in the northeast, or their, their attempt to take advantage of Ukraine's weight of combat power down in the south by pushing in the northeast seems to be um, running out of steam. And then just finally, so last night on TV, we saw Putin tasking Wagner's former chief of staff with uh, the, the role of overseeing volunteer fighter units in Ukraine. That was backed up by a Kremlin statement today. So we saw Putin addressing Andrei Troshev. This was said to be from last night. And Putin said, at the last meeting, we talked about you overseeing the formation of volunteer units that can carry out various tasks. First and foremost, of course, in the zone of the special military operation. You yourself have been fighting in such a unit for more than a year. You know what it is, how it is done. You know about the issues that need to be resolved in advance so that the combat work goes in the best and most successful way. I mean, we know how Wagner worked, particularly around the Bakhmut area, and that was empty the prisons, promise people six months service and you'll have your, your sentences wiped and then tell them to just run at the Ukrainian lines. So whether or not Mr. Troshev, as Putin says, you know how it's done, whether or not he just... He continues that. We will wait and see. But Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov last night told the RIA news agency that Troshev was working from the defence ministry. This is all part of, this goes back to the spat with Prigozhin about trying to get the volunteer units, of which there are many. Wagner was just the kind of most uh, notorious and noted. 
but Russia was trying to bring them into the defence ministry. Now, this meeting obviously underscores the Kremlin's attempt to show how they're in control um, of not only the Wagner Group, but but all the volunteer units uh, more broadly. And just to finish that off, today's Ministry of Ten- the British Ministry of Defence daily update says that hundreds of Wagner mercenaries are likely to have returned to Ukraine. It said the exact status of the redeploying personnel is unclear, but it is likely individuals has tra- have transferred to parts of the official Russian Ministry of Defence forces and other private military companies. We know, or we, we think there are a number of Wagner veterans grouping around Bakhmut. Maybe that's where they're going to be used. But I think we should just now, we note it and move on. I don't think there's any any cachet or strength left to the Wagner group. I think they are now diluted. I mean, still murderous, brutal, heavily armed. So we shouldn't discount their ability to act on the battlefield. But I don't think they're a coherent whole anymore. They don't have a, a galvanizing, charismatic leader. Let's see what Mr. Trochev comes up with. But Prigozhin was the real force behind Wagner. And obviously, he's who knows where he is. So we'll wait to see whether or not the this new, this rekindling of Wagner actually has any any real effect on the ground whatsoever. I'll take a pause there, David. Well, thank you very much, Tom. That was a very comprehensive account of where we are today on Friday. Um, Francis, can I come to you? What's the, the, there's been quite a lot of movement diplomatically and politically. Where would you like to start? Well, thanks, David. It's been a while since we've discussed the continuing rollout of sanctions against Russian officials by Western governments. So I actually wanted to start with the news that the British government has today imposed an asset freeze and travel bans on officials linked to elections in the annexed Ukrainian regions of Zaporizhia, Kherson, Luhansk, Donetsk and Crimea. The government said the sanctioned in- officials had been involved in recent sham elections in those places. I will quote directly from the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly. He said the UK will never recognise Russia's claims to Ukrainian territory. Crimea, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk and Kherson are Ukraine. Britain is also adding Russia's emergencies minister, Alexander Kurenkov, and the secretary of the Russian Central Election Commission, Natalia Budolina, to the sanctions list. Putin said, of course, the elections conducted this month in Russian-held parts of Ukraine marked a step towards their full integration into Russia. Suffice to say, this is a core pillar of the Russian strategy, another incentive for them to prolong this war for as long as possible and for Ukraine to achieve victory swiftly. If these occupied territories are liberated by the Ukrainians, one of the knottiest issues of this war will be how to repair the damage, as there will be many more Russians there than when the war began, something we discussed with Carolina Hurd at the Institute for the Study of War in Washington, the interview of which we put out last week and is extremely thought-provoking on this question. So if you haven't listened to it yet, I highly recommend it. Speaking of complex political challenges, the issue of future Ukrainian membership of the European Union rumbles on, with Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban saying that very difficult questions would need to be answered before the EU could even start membership talks with Ukraine. EU countries are due to decide in December whether they, to allow Ukraine to begin accession negotiations, which would require the unanimous backing of all 27 members. Hungary, which of course remains politically close to Russia, will be an obstacle. We cannot avoid the question, Orban said, when during the autumn we will have negotiations in Brussels about the future of Ukraine, whether we can actually seriously consider membership for a country to start a session talks with a country that is at war. We don't know how big the territory of this country is, as the war is still ongoing. We don't know how big its population is, as they are fleeing. To admit a country to the EU without knowing its parameters, this would be unprecedented. So I think we need to answer very long and difficult questions until we get actually deciding about the state of accession talks. So in other words, don't expect us to support it. Yet despite that, I think it is important to register the fact that this discussion is now being had with so many European countries supportive in principle. Yet another shift triggered by this war, which is the direct opposite of what Putin intended when he began it, which was, of course, designed to bring Ukraine back into the Russian sphere of influence. It's important not to forget that as we enter, well, 19th and 20th months of this war. 
The role played by Zelensky in that political transformation need not be summarised again. And it is thanks to that that we learned today he is in the running for this year's Nobel Peace Prize alongside Alexei Navalny, the currently imprisoned Russian opposition leader, a man not without controversy, something we've explored on the podcast in recent months. Although bookmakers have Mr Zelensky as the top candidate to join the Peace Laureates, I believe it's very unlikely, given the fact that he is a wartime leader, that he will win the top prize. But no doubt Kyiv will be welcoming this as it continues to keep the war very much in the international spotlight. Now, lastly, I want to draw attention to a piece by Ben Farmer here at The Telegraph into the cargo ship that has completed its voyage across the Black Sea, breaking Russia's shipping blockade. Military commanders, diplomats, grain markets and aid agencies worldwide are tracking its progress along the Black Sea as it hugged the Romanian and Bulgarian coasts after leading the Ukrainian port of Kornomorsk into the Bosporus and on to the Middle East. The 250-foot merchant ship called the Resilient Africa was laden with 3,000 tonnes and sailing under the flag of Palau, defying Moscow's blockade and becoming the first commercial vessel to visit and depart Ukraine since Russia pulled out of the safe passage deal for exports and instead threatened to attack them. It marks an ambitious Ukrainian scheme really to mark uh, and to break Moscow's naval siege and set up its own maritime corridor for its huge cereal and grain harvest. It also demonstrated how 18 months into the war, Kyiv has arguably turned the tables on Russia's once mighty Black Sea fleet, enough to keep its warships at bay, at least for now. So the resilient Africa was was quickly followed by another vessel ferrying nearly 18,000 tonnes of grain to Egypt. Three more ships are thought to be waiting to depart Ukraine imminently. And this development has raised hopes, as I say, of a return to more normal trade, which in turn may lead to a drop in worldwide grain prices and relief to some of the world's poorest countries, including many in Africa. A spokesman for the UN has told The Telegraph that while the UN is not involved in the movement of those vessels, we welcome all efforts for the resumption of normal trade, especially of vital food commodities that help supply and stabilise global food markets. We continue our efforts to facilitate exports for agricultural products from both Ukraine and the Russian Federation. Interestingly, the commander of Ukraine's Navy fleet last week said that he was trying to encourage more shipping as well, but as previously discussed, the success of the channel will also rely on the esoteric world of maritime insurance. Not the sexiest of subjects, but of vital importance to this. Ship owners and cargo buyers will only take the risk if they can be assured that they will get compensation if vessels are damaged, detained or delayed. And that in many ways is what the main impediment was, rather than the direct risk of ships being sunk. It was the financial implications of the blockade that was really causing the trouble. And Ukraine has been in talks for months with the insurance and shipping industry over how it could team up with the private sector to make cover available. Industry sources have said the first five vessels were thought to have been directly insured by Kiev, but then on Tuesday, the broker Miller said that it would set up a new insurance facility for grain exports in conjunction with Ukraine's authorities. One of the biggest questions remains whether Russia will sit back and let exports leave or will try to halt this shipping as it has threatened. It's unclear how effective the Black Sea Fleet remains or whether it is now preoccupied with the defence of Crimea. But this is quite a moment as it could put increasing pressure on Moscow in the negotiations on the future of the grain deal. If Ukraine can show that it can get grain out without Russian interference, then it puts them at a huge advantage in those negotiations and the West more broadly. So whilst a rather dry subject in many ways, this is a hugely important one and one that we will continue, continue to monitor very closely. Let's move to our final thoughts then ahead of the weekend. Uh, Dom Nichols, would you like to go first? Yeah, I am thinking, I've just, I was thinking this morning about the French drone swarm concept. This is not a, well, it's a relatively new idea, I suppose. It's... Um, British have the same same idea, but just put knitting these ideas together, drones and then a swarm, it all sounds very good until you actually look at how many 
how much investment is going into it. But, you know, it's, it's a growing thing. And I've, I've been wrestling lately with this idea of the whole drone thingy, in particular, first person view drones. So the folk we see you know, physically controlling the drones that are generally armed and they, they go and select their target. And I'm trying to work out if this is a just a new way of doing a very old military activity or if this is fundamentally changing the nature of warfare. And by that, I mean, if it's one thing to, to be in, a, in a, an operational zone and so you have your helmet and body armor on the whole time and you sort of move around as little as possible and you keep under hard cover, blah, 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 because you don't know if artillery is going to arrive, if you're being observed, et cetera, et cetera. But if now you don't even just that, isn't good enough and you have to have people out watching for these first person view drones then how much of the force is taken up doing that if you just have one person or two people in which case you just need three or four drones or yeah so if this drone swarm concept comes to fruition then i think it will will have a a hugely debilitating effect on the on the combat effectiveness of troops because you'll have to have so much of your force diverted to looking after that so i've i've just been wrestling with this thought at the moment and um i see this thing today from the french about their new drone swarm concept so that's what i'm thinking about that over the weekend and thinking is there something is there something fundamental here and we know that both sides are in, using huge amounts of drones i mean at its peak we hear that, that the ukraine said they were losing ten thousand, yes ten thousand drones a month i mean just a colossal number but they are cheap and if you're able to if you're able to use something that's a few hundred dollars or max, you know, for the really good ones, a few thousand dollars and destroy headquarters and and million dollar worth artillery systems, air defense, tanks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then, you know, as we enter, as I've described before, the, the phase three of this war, which is the industrial phase, who can who can last the longest industrially, then that's not a bad way to go. So a whole host of thoughts that I'm kind of wrestling with at the moment, but I just I just as we go into the weekend, I just think we're gonna we're gonna see more and more of these things. And I'd welcome people's view on whether or not it, it's just a new way of doing an old thing or a um, or, or a, a fundamental shift in how how we will be we will see dispositions and activity on the um, on the battlefield throughout its entire depth. Thanks very much, Dom. Francis Sternley. Thanks, David. Truth and lies, perpetrators and victims, the remains of two pipelines 80 metres below the surface of the Baltic Sea. As we've reported on the podcast, a year since the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines, there have been claims and counterclaims as to who exactly was responsible for one of the key strategic decisions of the war. Moscow, Washington and Kiev have all been blamed. And the leading journalistic investigators on this have been the German publication Die Zeit. And this week, they've published a huge investigation with graphics and maps titled Who Blew Up Nord Stream? It's the very definition of a long read, so I can't possibly summarise it all here, but it's the deepest analysis I've read so far into the question. They say it's impossible to rule out with complete certainty that Russia or the US had something to do with the attack, or perhaps even Poland. Yet they say it's now been established with almost complete certainty that the Nord Stream pipelines were attacked from the yacht that has been speculated about for some time and which we've touched on in the past, and that most of the clues lead not to Moscow or Washington, but to Kiev. As Desai summarises, and I quote, the first indications of possible Ukrainian involvement in the attack reached Desai last fall, but the information was too vague for a story and no second source could be found. Early this year, a journalist for the Contrast television magazine received information pointing to a potential Ukrainian connection. When Desait reported on the lead on March the 7th of this year, the story received significant international attention. Then in May, Süddeutsche Zeitung, together with public broadcasters NDR and WDR, identified a Ukrainian soldier thought to have been involved. Because of the complexity of the reporting and the wall of silence from officials, ARD, the Süddeutsche Zeitung and Die Zeit decided to join forces to continue reporting on the story. Die Zeit reporters travelled to Ukraine, Poland, Britain, the US and Sweden to report. They spoke with people involved in the investigation, police officers, intelligence agents, experts, politicians, military divers, sailors and harbour masters, in addition to examining satellite photos, images, film footage from the site of the explosions, investigative reports and maps. They also went on board the yacht itself. 
The unusual number of questions posed in this story are a product of the investigation not yet complete and the number of aspects that haven't yet been completely resolved. It is a fascinating read, David, beautifully written, and as they freely admit, raises more questions than answers. Yet clearly, given this uncertainty and the political implications, it's extremely difficult to report on, hence why it's clearly taken such extraordinary and impressive efforts to do so, which is to their credit. Whoever is responsible, the destruction of the pipelines remains a core event of this war, one that historians of the future will return to again and again not only because of its geopolitical importance, but because of its drama and its mystery. So I recommend it to listeners, David, and we'll be sure to include a link to it in the episode description. Marcy Kaptur is the longest serving woman in congressional history, a member of Congress for the Democrats since 1983. In that time, she's been a champion of many issues, including America's relationship with Ukraine and Eastern European countries more broadly. As co-founder and co-chair of the Ukraine Caucus in Congress, she has been a critical voice in American politics on matters relating to the country for many years, not just since the full-scale invasion. Among her many recent interventions, she called for President Biden to grant permission for F-16s to be given to Kyiv. During our trip to the United States, I had the pleasure of interviewing her for the podcast at her office in the capital where we discussed America's evolving relationship with Ukraine, the solidarity of American support for the country, and how she would rate the administration's response. This is our conversation. You are co-founder and co-chair of the Ukraine Caucus here in Congress. When, it, when was it founded and what work does it do? Well, of course, the Soviet Union, that tyranny collapsed in 1991. And as the states that had been captive nations began to try to grow out of that and create their own free societies. Uh, It was late in the 1990s that we began, we founded and created the Ukraine Caucus here in the House of Representatives. We also signed an agreement that's on the wall there with the then leaders of what was one of the first RADAs, And uh, we began to try to work with the RADA, which we've continued to do even until uh, the present day. But for the House of Representatives, we have about nearly 100 members out of 435 members, which is tremendous for any caucus here uh, in the House. And it has been quite active and it's bipartisan. And so we provide a forum for members to meet, for members to educate themselves, to receive visitors. President Zelensky will come again next week here to the United States. We will help receive him. So we are kind of a focal point for issues related to Ukraine. How solid do you think Congress's support is for Ukraine, as in support for the definition of victory as articulated by the Ukrainians themselves? Okay, I would say solid, very solid. It's bipartisan, and every vote that we have taken has been extremely strong the vast majority of members of Congress support it. Of course, we have some isolationists, every country does, but they are in a very small minority. But I think what's really important for the public to understand is that we need to tell the stories of what life was like in the former Soviet Union and what it's like in Russia today and what it is Ukraine is fighting for through individual person's stories. I think where we're weak, is that in our country, people who've emigrated from Ukraine in the last over the last century for freedom, for opportunity, they do not easily come forward and tell their story. Nobody invites them to tell their story. So I think one of the most important things we can do is explain what this fight is really about and that Ukraine is the scrimmage line for liberty on the European continent today. And that continent, why is that continent important to the American people? because these are the countries with which we have a political heritage that we actually grew out of as a nation from a legal standpoint and who fought with us to defeat Nazi tyranny and Soviet communism in the last century. How would you rate, therefore, the Democrats' response to the war in Ukraine? I have to tell you, I'm very proud and grateful to our congressional Democrats. Every single member has voted to support Ukraine 
and we've appropriated dollars for that. Obviously, a lot of expenditures are on the military side right now, but the people of Ukraine, as intelligent and as patriotic as they're preparing for rebuilding, and we're having discussions about that. I must tell you that as I see what's happening in Ukraine and I saw the Russian tanks coming into Kiev, I was reminded of the film Torn from the Flag, which was produced about the 1956 revolution in Hungary with the Soviet tanks coming into Hungary. And the same thing happened in the former Czechoslovakia. And so we have to understand this is a force that the Russians have. It hasn't changed. It's been altered but it's still there and it's very destructive. We have to protect NATO's Eastern Front and we have to be ready for any Russian incursion in freedom space. So we are working, obviously, as best we can with the government of Ukraine and all of our allies to protect freedom's edge uh, in that part of the world. So the democratic support has been a total. It's been magnificent. In February 2023, you signed a letter advocating for President Biden to give F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. There was and is certainly some hesitancy on the matter here in the US. Is America giving enough weapons support in your view? Well, we just sent uh, several dozen tanks from my region to Ukraine. Abrams tanks, M1A2s, uh, they can withstand mines. They have a very long range, but you need training. These are not easy to operate. So... The Some of the more simple tanks in Europe are probably a better first choice, and that has been done to some extent. For F-16s, you're talking about one of the most complex planes in the world and the most lethal. I actually have a photo on the wall. That's my district. I represent an F-16 unit, so we know them well. We understand the amount of training that is necessary for pilots and the <clears throat> threat that F-16s could pose to a counter-Russian response that would be very counterproductive. So the military has to weigh what is appropriate on any day. And in my opinion, Ukraine needs longer-range weapons in order to reach deeper into the space that Russia has invaded. And that is happening very slowly, and uh, it's, pa it's painful to watch. And we know that the our caucus has helped push for F-16 training and that will be underway. And, uh, but it also takes time. You talked about the absence of certain human stories. You've been particularly keen to shine a light on Ukrainian women, particularly in rural areas. Tell me a little bit more about that. I don't think the world realizes that Ukraine is being fed now. 75% of the food eaten comes from home gardens and from among the poorest places, women in the world. In Ukraine, Ukraine is the poorest country in Europe, and they survive on seeds from the prior harvest. They have they use natural fertilizers. I just so want to send them shovels and better buckets and pipe, that rubber tubing that we can take from the wells to where they have their little gardens to give them a little bit more because they, that's a picture from France, but they live in the fields, right. and no one sees them, and yet they're feeding the country. A lot of Ukraine's grain is exported, but the people who are holding that country together in terms of food are the babushas, and nobody pays them respect. And I have failed. I have tried. I have sent my own seed. I have sent people in there to try to help them just ease their burden a little bit. They... I don't know of stronger people in the world. You have Polish heritage. How does that inform your view of this conflict? Well, <laughs> you'd, have, you'd have to know a little bit about the history of Poland. But Poland was the first country uh, in that part of the world right after our civil, excuse me, after our revolutionary war in our country to sign a declaration, the Poniatz Declaration in South Western Poland to eliminate serfdom from that region. And for that, Poland was wiped off the map of Europe for 125 years and absorbed by three adjoining empires, the German, the Austrian, Hungarian, and the Russian. So it was penalized. You could say it was slave-whipped uh, in the law. And 
serfdom was continued. That's why I'm here in this country, because our grandparents fled that part of the world to earn money in hopes to go back and buy a parcel of land. They had one cow, and they were told by the Bolsheviks, you can't grow. The Bolsheviks were collectivizing the land during the Tsarist period, and they told them, you know, you can't graze your cow. How are they supposed to eat? They came to our country with nothing but one plant, which still grows in my backyard. It's called sorrel, great soup. You can make great soup out of that. And that was it. And then they couldn't go back. Our grandmother had a poem that I treasure where it talks about the church bells ringing and how much she missed the church bells, the sound of the church bells across the fields. Well, we didn't really know where she had come from. Exactly. We had a name, but there are several places in today's Ukraine that have that same sound. But we were able to find it back in the 1970s on my first trip there when it was Soviet occupied. So Poland and Ukraine's borders switched. And there are many people of Polish and other Romanian, Hungarian heritages inside Ukraine because of the history of that region. So it's a very pluralistic country, ethnically, religiously, and it's a crossroads between Turkey and the West. So the whole history of that region is so fascinating. And I found the friendliest people, the most hardworking, the most exploited. I've spent a lot. I probably traveled to Ukraine more than any other member of Congress, living or dead, and going way back to the Soviet period. So I have seen the change in the younger generation, the younger generation in their eyes. You can see it. They can see a better future than their parents and grandparents had, and we have to help them achieve it. Turning back here to Congress, imagine hypothetically that the Republican Party wins the next presidential election or even just takes back the Senate. What do you think the implications of that for Ukraine are? Well, it could be catastrophic for the fight for liberty in that part of the world. We've seen certain candidates, even some senators in our country, say they will withdraw support for Ukraine. And they even seem to indicate support for Vladimir Putin, who is an ally of uh, the former president of our country, or at least appears to be. So I'll continue to work with the presidents of either party, as I always have. But I have to say there's no stronger ally of Ukraine to have in the Oval Office than President Joe Biden. And I have a picture with him up on that wall and with John McCain when we were there in 19... Let me see what year was that. 14. 2014. What's interesting about 2014, the Sochi Olympics were also occurring at that time. And if you look at Vladimir Putin's lie on global news about the history of Russia and the Soviet Union, he invaded Ukraine that same week that that film was shown. It was a very, very dark effort of propaganda. But it's, I think it's from a media standpoint, it's interesting to look at that, to look at the Russian lie and then the invasion the very same week. It was all planned. How would you assess American foreign policy in recent years? We've had Afghanistan, we've had many other notable events. Would you say it's been good or bad? I think the foreign policy is a bit confusing. The way that I summarize it in my own mind is that America lost, speaking for our old country, the United States lost focus on the fact that it had become dependent on imported energy. And so going back to the 1970s, we fell into it, and we had the first Arab oil embargo back in the late 70s. I worked for President Carter then, and I saw what happened to our country. I supported his creation of the U.S. Department of Energy. We are now on the cusp of being energy independent. We're not out of the woods yet, but a lot of the alliances that were formed in the last century were alliances with countries that do not share our political values. And so we are readjusting. And I view what happened in Iraq as an oil war, in Kuwait as an oil war. What was Afghanistan all about? Well, yes, it was after going after Osama bin Laden, but he was from the oil kingdom, right? And a lot of the men that were involved on 9-11 from Yemen, these are all countries that have won export oil. So we became, under Donald Rumsfeld and others, Dick Cheney, I think we went into Afghanistan not just to get Osama bin Laden, but I think they wanted to then bookend Iran on both sides. They wanted Iraq and Afghanistan. So it was strategic. I think they made a mistake. I never knew that we would be in Afghanistan for 20 years. 
And unfortunately, Donald Trump made a deal with the Taliban and completely, during his presidency, pulled the rug out of all of the other people that we had been working with in Afghanistan to create an alternate government. So Joe Biden inherited a Humpty Dumpty that fell off the wall, that crumbled into pieces, that didn't start under his administration. But if one looks back, I think that was what maybe the big idea was. And we as a world have to be more intelligent about the manner in which we work with Iran. And there are a lot of people in Iran who are highly educated, who we must find a way to deal with this nation and not just let them make all these alliances with Russia. The Iranian people are highly educated, highly intelligent, hardworking people. They can have a better society. That Persian area and all, I mean, it's just magnificent. And uh, an interesting story, going back to World War II, in terms of Poland, the largest Polish graveyard in the world is in Tehran. Because of the march of the Russian, they moved some of their prisoners across the Middle East to get to Lebanon, to get to fight at the Battle of Monte Cassino. And so I think Poland and Iran have could have a special relationship. I don't know whether they pursue one or not, but it's a natural one. I've often wanted to visit the Polish graves in Tehran, but of course, we're not really welcome there now. But there's a whole story there. Staying with geopolitics, you also serve as a member of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Where do you stand on how best to deal with that country? Well, first of all, we have to maintain relations. And I'm glad that the president, our president, has been traveling there, being very clear on maintaining an open relationship. We have a huge trade relationship with China. We have a huge financial relationship, but obviously we uh, do not share their political values. I think that we have to keep dialogue open. I have had to represent companies that did business in China and were not paid. Legally, we have to just keep the doors to dialogue open let our businesses, our educational institutions build bridges slowly over time. And we have to make sure that the dumping of goods such as steel, uh, we stand up to that globally and not let it happen and wipe out our industries here. So we understand the strategic plans that China has for dumping to hurt, that hurt Western companies. And we're just going to have to work it out over time. It won't be easy. By nature of being superpower, the U.S. adopts a geopolitical role as a standard bearer of freedom and democracy, which we've just talked about. In that context, how healthy do you think American democracy is? Well, of course, American democracy has always been tested. It's always under test every single day. And I think that right now, where we are, the American people have mostly come up to me and say, Marcy, get people to work together. There are a lot of forces that operate on the internet and so forth to try to create division. We have to elevate those activities that create unity and purpose. And really, the American people don't like all this Mickey Mouse that's going on in Congress. They really don't like it. They want people who deliver. They want to, they've got a plenty to worry about in their own lives, and they want a thriving economy. The, again, global oil markets, the global energy markets, have impacted us so heavily. Every time America's had a recession in the last 40 years is triggered by oil prices that rise over $4 a gallon, right? So we have to be energy independent. That's my key committee. I spent a lot of time working on it, and I think we've got real progress that we're showing. We could have done it faster, but there were a lot of interests that tried to stop us. And there's a role for many forms of energy. But we and our allies have to be energy independent at home. Look at Europe. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which I did not support. I support the Three Seas Initiative. I support the nuclear power that's going into Ukraine, into um, uh, Poland now, looking for ways to work with our allies to invent the future of energy, new energy systems for our world. And we will do it. 
We will absolutely do it. I have no doubt we're on track to do that. So, But our democracy is, is being put to the test. We had those radicals that came up here to the Capitol a few years ago, and I was caught in that mess here. What an embarrassment to democracy. But the Statue of Freedom still sits atop the Capitol, and uh, we're here doing the people's work. Energy security, very important for Europe. But what advice would you give European countries that are still heavily reliant on U.S. military support as we enter this presidential election year? Well, the our bond with Europe is permanent. And our respect for the law and the rule of law and the borders of nations as territorially integral and no nation has the right to invade another nation unprovoked as Russia has done. So we have to continue to be a voice for liberty, for democracy in the world. And I've been so impressed with so many of the European ambassadors, with the leaders of their country, and frankly, with our government, President Biden and General Mark Milley, leading, uh, and, and so many others, a strong coalition of uh, European leaders. And uh, for Britain, I'm just so proud to be on your program and to having gone to school at the University of Manchester as part of my own education to learn how to build new towns and how London and uh, Runcorn and all the places around Great Britain after the war, what you did, what you did. This is what Ukraine will have to do. I think that Britain will be a great model for the rebuilding of Ukraine when that day comes. And one final question. If you were in the White House, how would you respond to President Putin today? I would stand up to him. I would follow in President Biden's steps, and I would assure that Ukraine is victorious. Because you have to stop tyranny wherever its blood runs over the border. You can't let it seep into other countries. And I would do everything possible to mobilize the business community, the educational community, the humanitarian community to focus on that part of the world right now. We've got issues in Libya, right? We've got issues in our own country in Hawaii where we've had climate change disasters. And uh, But I really think we have to be vigilant and we have to be persevering and we can't let down our guard. We have to make sure that we deliver in this new era another country that wants to access to liberty into the community of Europe. And is there anything else that's on your mind which may not be on our listeners or that you'd like to, to end with? Well, there's one, just one personal thing. I come from a family of veterans over many generations. And one of them was uh, in Europe, in, in England, before the D-Day invasion during World War II. And he had such fond memories. Of course, after they crossed the English Channel, it was utter hell. And, but he made it. And he helped to free Paris and the go into Luxembourg and Belgium then. So we in our own family know the price. And he came home more wounded, great American, as so many others. And um, so one of the thoughts that I've had as a member of Congress is how do the younger generation, the younger generations in our country understand what they really gave to us? And we've created a project called Liberty Road in our country where a year ago I went to Poland with General Milley, Mark Milley, the head of our Joint Chiefs, and we dedicated a new archival initiative in Warsaw, Poland. And I give your listeners this idea to think how the Brits might be able to help. I did not know when we were there that during the uh, Warsaw Uprising, American pilots actually were killed over Warsaw, but they were part of the... Royal Air Force, and they have stars now there for Americans who died. And I thought, I was presenting stories of Americans who had been naturalized citizens in our country, who had begun their lives in Poland, and then their whole future was ripped apart. But they ended up surviving, and they came to America. And I took back the stories of six Americans to Poland, to this museum of the Warsaw Uprising, which is now stop one on Liberty Road. And Liberty Road is an effort to put together the broken histories of people who emigrated. And I encourage those who are British to think about this because there are stories in Britain. One of my staff's grandmothers was in Leeds and they were bombed during World War II. Now this granddaughter ended up working for the Army Corps of Engineers and all. She understood 
what is at stake for our world. So don't think that the stories of your heritage are not important one by one by one by one. And the countries that they may have come from, restore those histories so that the American people understand, because the American people don't really understand a lot about Central Europe because our soldiers didn't go east of Berlin for the most part. So there's not a depth of understanding there. And there were complexities involved with Yalta and everything else. So our people are somewhat naive as to the absolute terror that attended the Russian state. And we need to educate. And that's done family by family. So you might look at the Liberty Road Initiative as an example of what the people of Britain could do, the people of Canada, just like the people of the United States, and to tell these stories. And one of the reasons I got so active in this is because I realized that some of the people that ended up here had been in the Polish military and the underground. Their story's not told in Poland because they had to leave, right? They were expunged. But then when they came here, they couldn't speak the language. They were poor, but brilliant. And their story wasn't told here. Oh, my goodness. So these few surviving stories are historical gold, and they need to be pre- they need to be collected, and they need to be presented in all of our countries as we understand what they gave us. And when they got here, uh, in this uh, case, I was focused on Poland, but the same could be true for Ukraine, for Hungary, for all these countries. I realized that our people didn't know about them either. And so we've just produced something that was on PBS here called Freedom Means Never Surrender. I think these stories are historical gold, and they're not being presented now in a way that they should from the Ukrainian side to explain to people what's really at stake, what's really at stake for them. Thank you very much. For Thank you very much. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, We are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.